Good evening and welcome, everyone. Uh, for the conquest. Uh, it was such a blessing tonight to be able to meet in the fellowship hall. We uh, resumed having Wednesday night suppers. I believe that was the first time since the, uh, since the pandemic. So great to share a meal together, and uh, uh, it, was, it was fantastic. Really good Alfredo sauce, Robert's homemade Alfredo. Ooh, it's good. Okay, uh, but uh, welcome again to everyone here. Um, I guess that's a plug for the next Wednesday night supper if you didn't make it to this one. Or maybe you can find some of the leftovers if you can. I highly recommend it. Okay, so um, let's, let's get into it. So last time on the uh, conquest, we finished looking uh, at the allocation of the remaining seven tribes that were assigned by lot in Joshua 18 and 19. Here's two different uh, maps and representations of, of the division of the land. And again, it's worth noting that they're not... They're not exact. I, I read that quote last week about how borders are subject to change, and sometimes they're difficult to, to track down. Sometimes uh, the descriptions in, in Joshua are focused on um, geographic features. Sometimes they're focused on cities. Uh, so it is, it's a challenge. and something that, the, um, that uh, the Bible student and the archaeologist can, can really dig into and investigate. Um, so we pointed out some interesting facts about most of the tribes. Uh, for example, the, the blessing of Jacob spoke uh, to Zebulun as being by the sea, uh, and they ended up landlocked in their inheritance. So we were kind of considering, well, how did that happen? Um, I also learned that uh, Mount Carmel is a mountain range and not a solitary mountain by the sea. This is, again, where um, Elijah confronts the, po- the prophets of Baal. And uh, we also talked about the curious case of Dan, the, the, the last allotment, ending up uh, in, uh, in northern um, Israel. And as Dan Allegood pointed out to me tonight, that in the blessing to, uh, to Dan from Jacob, he talks about how Dan will, will judge his brothers. Uh, Samson uh, comes from the tribe of Dan, so there was at least one judge that was from the tribe of Dan. Um, and then... We talked about Joshua's inheritance in the land of Ephraim, Ephraim in Timnath Sarah, and there's a picture of what that looks like today. Again, it's a mound. It's built up a tell. Um, and then, uh, then the division of the land was completed. And as we left off last week, uh, so this week, we're going to be talking about assuming the worst. Uh, but as we left off last week, we were getting into the cities of refuge in chapter 20. Um, and we were again kind of uh, imagining the, uh, you know, like painting the scene, imagining uh, someone running for their life uh, to a city of refuge uh, while being hotly pursued by another man. Um, and then this, this first man, maybe he's running to the city gates of, of Hebron, and he shouts out, I accidentally killed a man. We were chopping down wood, and my axe head flew off and, and killed him. It wasn't deliberate. It wasn't on purpose. Please let me in and hear my case. And then the elders would, would let him in. Um, and it, it is interesting, I'll, I'll get into this in a little bit, I was trying to find any example, any, any uh, other mention in the Bible or tradition or story from real life about the cities of refuge of like when it was actually, you know, used, an example of use, and I, I couldn't track one down. But we'll get into more of that in a minute. Let's review again this, this context. Let's take a look at Joshua 20, and we'll just read 1 through 6. And there are similar notes in Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy 19, if you want to refer to them as well. They give additional insight, which I love. I've I've seen this over and over again in in studying Joshua. You're going to find a lot of um, correlations in Numbers and Deuteronomy. A lot of the design for the conquest is in those two books. Okay, Joshua 20. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. Uh, They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. You shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the city, the gate of the city, and explain his case to the elders of that city. Then they shall take him into the city and give him a place, and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give give up the manslayer into his hand, because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment, until the death of him who was high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home, to the town from which he fled. And now, page two. I guess that's actually Paul Harvey. It's an old Paul Harvey reference. 
<laughs> the rest of the story. Yeah. So they're describing today what's called uh, manslaughter. It's the accidental, uh, non-intentional killing of another person. And I couldn't help but look up at our own laws on this. Um, and you can, you can Google for the Idaho laws on, on uh, manslaughter, and it'll take you right to the, uh, right to the text. So Idaho statutes, Title 18, uh, dealing with crimes and punishments. That sounds like Dostoevsky. Uh, chapter 40, dealing with homicide. Um, section 18.4006 defines manslaughter as the unlawful killing of a human being, including but not limited to a human embryo or fetus without malice. So that's the, the key difference between murder and manslaughter is malice, it's intent. Um, and uh, it, it, some of that still gets kind of interesting. I was looking up what's the difference between like, you know, second degree murder and manslaughter. It's, it's still a little confusing to me. Um, but I do think that we see, even in our own uh, justice system today, some of this influence directly from our heritage uh, in the Bible as well. Um, but but what, what, why this structure? I have to ask myself, why the cities of refuge? What's, what's going on here? Um, so verse 3 uses the phrase avenger of blood. Um, and it's used multiple times in Numbers 35. Uh, so who is that? Well, it's, it's the person who has a legal uh, right to the, to the life of that killer. Uh, so this is interesting. The avenger of, of blood... It's the translation of Goel Hadam, and the term Goel literally means redeemer. Another way to, to read this is the redeemer of blood. Um, this this uh, term Goel, it's the same one used for a kinsman redeemer, the closest relative to the one deceased, uh, whose duties include avenging or redeeming his relative's blood, or to even marry his uh, wife and produce offspring for the family uh, inheritance. Uh, and the Goel, the Redeemer, could also redeem his relative from slavery, which I didn't realize. That's in Leviticus 25, 48 and 49. So I still also say, like, but, you know, why? Why does, the, uh, why does the avenger of blood have a right to, to do this, to avenge? Um, this is my own theory, and uh, if someone has something better, please uh, let me know. I could have missed a, a, could have missed a lot, <laughs> actually. Um, but I think what this gets back to is, is actually the, the laws around uh, restitution. This was the way I was making sense of it. Exodus uh, 21, 23 is a very famous verse. Uh, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So we all, we all know the phrase, an eye for an eye. But the one that comes before that is, is life for life. So I think that might also be part of the reason why uh, we're seeing this, um, this restitution here, that there has, been, there has been a loss of life, and this life is now being sought out. Uh, so, the, so the accused may flee to a city of refuge, and the Lord commanded against six cities, three east of the Jordan and three on the west. Uh, any other thoughts about, again, why this, why this structure? Anyone else studied the cities of refuge before? Uh, yeah, Shelby. You got a mic? Yep. But the Avenger, was that uh, a right to do that, or was it a requirement to go after the uh, person? And if it was commonly known that this was an accident, would he still seek him until he got to the city of refuge? Ah, that's a really good question. Like, is he under obligation? Like, the, he would be as a kinsman redeemer. He's under obligation to continue the family line. I don't know about that. Clint? Mike, Mike's coming. Do, 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 do. I don't know, like some music or Muzak. Yeah. Well, it, it seems to a degree that, you know, I've, I've in reading about some of this, that this is for the good of the people as a whole. Because, I mean, if, uh, if somebody accidentally kills Blake, I'm going to be mad about it, you know, and, and, and I'm going to not be able to always clearly see it as an accident. Mm, mm -hmm. And as, you know, in, of course, their day it was a little different way of doing things. Yeah. Thinking that I had the right to avenge him, you know, they, then the person who, does, who commits this accident can go to this city of refuge and cooler heads prevail. And, I mean, it, it, it is in some ways a way to protect the people as a whole, as a, a, a way to make them a civil society. Because, I mean, if, if 
you, uh, use your your idea of chopping the tree and your axe head comes off, well, I might just think, well, you idiot, you should have had your axe head secured. You, it, might be true. it was negligence. It was stupidity. So you have you need to die for my son's death. Hmm. But the cities of refuge kind of is a built-in fail-safe. So that so they do have a judicial structure and and some time to to think things through a little bit. Very good. Yeah, Dan, did you have something? Can we pass it on? Dan? Nope. Please. <laughs> and if Blake or or Luke want to say something in that chain. <laughs> Well, kind of going along with, uh, with what uh, Clint said, uh, you look at the example in our country of the Hatfields and the McCoys. I mean, supposedly it started over a pig. Mm. And then you had people, and I've, I've watched numerous like documentaries on this. Yeah. I mean, it was disgusting, the, the hatred that they ended up uh, having toward one another. And so, I mean, if, if you're constantly reciprocating back and forth, and, and everyone has to take it up a notch. Yeah. I mean, where do you win? And, and like Clint said, you know, the, the cooler heads prevailing that, that are non-biased. I, yeah, that's a good point. So like retaliation just kind of getting uh, bigger and bigger until you get these rivalries. Very good point. Uh, yes. And uh, thank you, Dave, for running the mic. Appreciate it. So when you said that the Avenger of Blood is also a redeemer, well, <laughs> Given that we're Christians, instantly I think of Christ. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I got teary-eyed at the thought. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, the reality is we unintentionally, we have blood that was shed mm -hmm. unintentionally because of our sin all of the time. Yeah. And what a thought that the pursuer is God. He's mm -hmm. the one who's pursuing us until we're in the city of refuge. Mm -hmm. Hell, what if the church is the city of refuge? Oh. We are pursued by the the father of whose blood was shed because he's our redeemer yeah yeah well said and in fact i might get to that here in a second you're always right ahead of me but doing a great job of that so thank you i appreciate it okay let's get to the map and then we'll get to that idea too but i think you said it extremely well so uh first to the map oh did ed did you have something too oh, thank you uh, going back here to Exodus 21 there in verse 22, well, 24 through 25 that you read, hmm. it wasn't a law for retaliation from the studies I've made over the years, okay. but it was a limit of punishment that could be provided that it would fit the crime. Mm -hmm. The punishment fits yeah. the crime. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A yeah. lot of people take it out of context and they say, yeah, well, you know, I'm a you, you took my, I am going to take, take yours. yours. Yeah. But it's not retaliation at all. Okay, that's fair. L limits on, on the punishment. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Ed. Okay, so to the map then. Very good. Um, yeah, so to the cities themselves, these are listed in uh, verses 7 through 9. I like this map because it shows the cities um, were reachable from most places within a day's journey. That's what those those circles mean, and they kind of remind me of that classic game, Missile Commander, too. It's like a video game. Anyway, um, so you had Kadesh in the uh, hill country in Galilee. That's in the land of Naphtali. Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim. Uh, Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron in the hill country of Judah. It's a happen in place. Uh, Bazir in the wilderness on the tableland in Reuben. And Ramoth in Gilead of the tribe of Gad. So there's some gaps in there, a little bit of overlap, but part of the command was to also try to distribute, distribute these. And then, of, oh yeah, I miss Golan in, in Bashan in the land of Manasseh. And this is uh, from blueletterbible.org. Uh, again, I, I recommend that as a resource. Uh, so just getting to the city clearly wasn't enough. The elders of the city would render judgment about the innocence of the accused, and the accused had to stay in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. Um, this is, now, this is one thing I found about traditions around this. There's a Jewish tradition in the Mishnah, which is kind of like the, the written down uh, oral traditions that they had. So there's a tradition that the mother of the high priest would provide food and clothing for those who sought refuge so that they wouldn't pray for the death of, of her son, which is kind of an interesting thought. It sounds like one of those traditions, but um, an interesting idea. Uh, but in a sense, then, the high priest's blood is another aspect of this, atoning for the, the blood of the deceased. Um, and so for us as Christians, I think to, uh, I was like, where is this verse? And I finally had to search it out. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, 17 through 18. I'll give a little more context here. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So we could think of uh, as Christ's blood uh, as like our atoning high priest, or we could consider again as God is pursuing us and we are fleeing to, to the refuge of, of that blood. But it does, either way, it, fleeing for refuge kind of evokes that, uh, that imagery in the Old Testament. Any other thoughts before we move on? Okay, let's get into the, yes, Ken. Oh, we got the, ah, I've got this mic, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> well, in Genesis 9, before any other law, God's law was whoever sheds man's blood, his blood will be shed. Yeah. So, because man is, uh, or in the image of God, he made man. Right. So, it was... God's law before he ever produced or said anything to Moses. Uh, yeah, good point. So Kim was pointing out that it goes back to the Noahic covenant. Whoever sheds man, man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Yep, very good. Okay, let's get into the, uh, to the Levites then. We're in chapter 21. So it is interesting that the, the allocation um, is, is complete at the end of uh, chapter 19, uh, it says, so they finished dividing the land. This was in 1951, uh, not the year, the verse. Okay, uh, but here we have to still deal with the Levites. Uh, let's actually take a quick look, because what we basically have in chapter 21 is a, is a listing of the cities. Let's take a quick look at, uh, at Numbers 35 about this. So if you could, turn back with me to Numbers 35. The Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan of, at Jericho, so this is before they had, had crossed over, saying, Command the people of Israel to give to the Levites some of the inheritance of their possession as cities for them to dwell in, and you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities. The cities shall be theirs to dwell in, and their pasture lands shall be for their cattle and for their livestock and for all their beasts. The pasture lands... Of the cities, which you shall give to the Levites, shall reach from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits all around. Um, and let me just skip down a little bit, because he's going to describe this in another way, as like a, as like a square, it's like a box. Um, verse 6, the cities that you shall give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, where you shall permit the manslayer to flee. And in addition to them, you shall have 42 uh, cities. All the cities that you give to the Levites then will be 48 with their pasture lands. So that's 12, basically 12 times 4. Okay, so we did, a couple weeks ago, we looked at the blessing to, uh, to Simeon, and it's the same one to Levi as well. I, I, shouldn't, I should have put that back up on the screen, but I won't. That they would be dispersed throughout Israel. So Jacob prophesied about this. Um, and... Uh, it's interesting to know what, what this would look like. The description given in Numbers 35 describes kind of a box with the city in the middle uh, of, of, of about 1,000 yards by 1,000 yards, and the Levites get the pasture land uh, directly around the cities. Um, and then the, the division of the cities to the Levites are listed in Joshua 21, um, and the land is divided by lot between the three clans of the Levites. The Kohathites contain the line of the high priest, uh, the Gershonites and the Mer Merorites. Uh, verse 4 through 7 give an overview of this division, and then the rest of the chapter, 8 through 40, details a list of the cities. Uh, one call out again here is uh, Hebron is mentioned, uh, and it's just a, it's a happening place. Uh, it's, it's given to the Levites, it's a possession of Caleb, it's a city of refuge, it's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I was trying to think if that could indicate, you know, like God's devo Caleb's devotion to God or if he volunteered the city in one way or another, but that's just, you know, idle speculation. Uh, so 48 cities, that's about four per tribe. And um, through these chapters, Joshua repeats um, that the Levites are not to have an inheritance. We see this in Joshua 13, 14 and 13, 33, and also in chapter 14, verse 4. Uh, but why is this? This is a good refresher. 
Why are the Levites scattered throughout Israel? Well, there's the blessing of Jacob that we already discussed about Levi and Simeon, but there's more to it than that. Um, let me put on the screen Numbers 3, 11 through 13. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel, instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for my own all the firstborn in Israel, both a man and a beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. So after the Passover, after the death of the firstborn in Egypt, God claimed the firstborn of every man and every animal in Israel. That's Exodus 13.1. God now claims the Levites instead of the firstborn. They take the, the place of the firstborn. Uh, and I could say just, again, from a practical example, looking at Levitical regulations where priests are involved in, in the cleanliness of the people, and they're, it also sounds like they're mold inspectors. I don't know where Dane is at. Um, but... You know, there's very practical value in having the, the Levites throughout the land as well, dispersed. So it, it fits well with, with, the, uh, with the Old Covenant, with the uh, Law of Moses. Okay, any thoughts on the Levites? I was just kind of, kind of, like, skim right through chapter 21. Yeah, Larry, let me run you a mic. This is in my range. I was just going to say, uh, between the priests and the Levites, it's like equivalent of our judiciary. Okay, yeah, very good. Between the priests and the Levites, like the equivalent of our judiciary. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, uh, let's look at the very end of uh, chapter 21, because there is, there's something really great here, and this is kind of like a we made it moment, but it's another great a transition in this passage as well, and I'll put it up on the screen, but please you know, follow along in your, in your Bibles as well. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he had swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. And so we come to the end of uh, Joshua 22, and uh, it's a good time for things to calm down. It looks like, uh, you know, peace, uh, no, no, no more problems, no more worries. Maybe it's the time to uh, settle down a bit, settle the land. But it's going to get interesting here, actually, in uh, chapter 22. Uh, in chapter 22. Excuse me, we come to the end of 21 into 22. Break my notes. All right, let's take a look at the uh, beginning of uh, chapter 22. I'll read verses 1 through 9. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers there, uh, these many days down to this day, and have been careful to keep the charge of the law, the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers, as he promised them. Therefore turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cling to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That sounds like Deuteronomy. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Let me keep reading here. Now to the one-half tribe of the tribe of Manasseh, now to the one-half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses gave had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half Joshua had given a possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan. And when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, Go back to your tents with much wealth and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and with much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. So the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned home, parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, their own land of which they had uh, possessed themselves by command 
of the Lord through Moses. Okay, so Joshua commends the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh for their faithful service during the conquest, and he dismisses them to go to their tents east of the Jordan. He also takes this opportunity to encourage them to continue in their faithfulness to God in verse 5. And this is going to be something he's going to do to all of Israel in chapters 23 and 24, which I'm looking forward for us to get to as well. Uh, Joshua also sends them away with spoil uh, from the conquest, including livestock and precious metals. And they leave uh, Shiloh and return, return home to the land of Gilead, it, se- it says in verse 9. I think it's interesting that the lands east of the Jordan River are, are referred to as the land of Gilead here. Um, and remember, we had those different maps where we're redrawing where Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh are because of that. So it's, it's also used to refer to the lands east of the Jordan in a general term as well. All right, so let's take a look here. Let's uh, go to verse 10. Oh, there's the commandment in verse 5. All right, verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. And the people of Israel heard it, uh, said, Behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Okay, so uh, that escalated quickly. Uh, the, the Transjordan tribes, they built an altar that is about the Jordan. It's, it's a little confusing to me on which side here. I, I would have thought this would have been east of the Jordan, but it reads like in verse 12, uh, excuse me, in verse 11, that it's west of the Jordan, on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. It's also fascinating when sometimes these conflicts arise, suddenly it's like, that's Israel and that's not Israel. I'm like, well, I thought they were both Israel, but anyway. So, but they set up this altar somewhere around the frontier, somewhere around the, the division. It might be west of the Jordan. Um, it's an impressive altar. Uh, when the rest of Israel hears about this, they're ready to go to war over this altar. So let's keep reading. What happens here? Verse 13. Then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and with him ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them the head of the family uh, among the clans of Israel. And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And they said to them, so now we're east of the Jordan, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor, from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves, and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord, that you too must turn away this day from following the Lord? And if you too rebel against the Lord today... Then tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. But now, if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan the son of Zerah break faith in the matter of the devoted things and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel? And he did not perish alone for his iniquity." Okay, so again, it's a little confusing. It sounds now like they're east of the Jordan, like the altar might be east of the Jordan. It doesn't really matter, but for me with the details, it kind of does. Um, A couple of observations here. Uh, First of all, they didn't send Joshua. They didn't send a a man of war, even though they're ready to get fighting. They didn't send, you know, the big leader. They they sent uh, Phineas, the son of Eliezer. They sent a, a commission. They sent 10 chiefs with him. And I, again, kind of have to ask myself, why? Well, this, in some ways, this is a spiritual matter. They're, they're sending someone with spiritual, you know, some authority in these matters to go and investigate it. And I'll give them credit. They're not just marching out to war. They're going to figure out what's going on first. Um, and you can, you can hear over and over, what's, what's their concern? What's their worry? It's guilt by association. They're worried that God's going to get mad about this altar, and he's going to take it out on everyone. 
And you can see they give a couple, he gives a couple of examples here. Uh, Peor, this is in uh, Numbers chapter 25, when the people go after Baal and start worshiping Baal, and there's a plague. Um, he talks about um, uh, the, sin of, the sin of Achan, uh, which we, we already discussed, and how, again, he did not perish alone for his iniquity. Their main point here is, we're not going to be taken with you into this path of sin. We're not going to do that. Um, by the way, the Lord struck down 24,000 in that plague in uh, Numbers 25. So in, num- in, in verse 19, they're worried about being held accountable for the sin of this altar. And uh, clearly this is very, very strong wording. Um, but I also have to ask myself, well, why are, they, why are they worried about an altar? What's the big deal? I thought we made altars all the time uh, in the Old Testament. And again, that's probably my ignorance speaking. <laughs> um, so what are they worried about? Are they worried that the Transjordan tribes are, are worshiping another god or not following God's laws? I mean, he talks about that, that Baal worship that they had. Um, Joshua built an altar when the covenant was renewed on Mount uh, Ebal in, in, I believe it was chapter 8. So what's the problem with another altar? I think there's another concern here that why would they be worried about God getting angry about this? I think they're worried about unauthorized worship. Um, God commanded an altar... In, uh, in a couple places, in Exodus 20, 24, and then the bronze altar of the tabernacle was described in Exodus 27, 1 through 8. Uh, and the people have also seen the consequences of unauthorized worship when we think about Nadab and Abihu being killed by God after, offer, off, offering, excuse me, after offering unauthorized fire. So um, they're worried that this is either set up in rebellion or just improper because they shouldn't be doing their burnt offerings, their sacrifices here. They're supposed to be doing that at the tabernacle. So the people are taking this seriously. It's a good reminder. I think it can also be a good reminder to us to take our worship seriously. They're concerned about it. All right, where does this go? What's going on here? Verse 21. Then the people of uh, Reuben, the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, He knows, and let Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. (coughs) Or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. No, but we did it for fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord, so your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore we said, let us, build an, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you, and between our generations after us, that we do not perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings, so that your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. And we thought, if this should be said to us or to our descendants in time to come, we should say, behold, the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offering, or sacrifice, other than the altar of the Lord, our God, that stands before his tabernacle. Okay. So the, the Transjordan tribes, um, they get to make their case now. And they start by giving glory to God. And they do it very emphatically, and they do it twice. Um, and this reminds me again when, when Joshua is confronting Achan. We get back to Achan. And he says, uh, give, God to, you know, give glory to God. And what does he mean? He means give glory to God by telling him the truth. So they're saying, look, we're telling the truth. I'm going to make it so serious that I'm going to also declare the Lord is God. But they're also, you know, reasserting their devotion to the Lord. And they're addressing these fears directly. The fear of that this altar is for another God. They're saying that's not the case. The fear that this is for improper worship. They're also saying we're not going to do that. Okay, so what is the story? Uh, Now they clarify that they're concerned in the future that they might be cut off from worshiping the Lord west of the Jordan. So they build a replica altar as a witness. They didn't do this in rebellion. And they won't sacrifice on any other altar except the one at the tabernacle. Okay, so this is the other side of the of the story. So let's see how this is resolved then. Let's look at verse 30. 
When Phineas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel, who were with him, heard the words that were the people that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of the of Manasseh spoke. I was going to say half tribe. They had me going on that this whole time. Okay. It was good in their eyes. And Phineas, the son of Eliezer the priest, said to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. Then Phineas, the son of Eliezer the priest, and the chiefs returned from the people of Reuben and the people of Gad in the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan to the people of Israel, and brought back word to them. And the report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel, and the people of Israel blessed God, and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the people of Reuben and the people of Gad were scattered. The people of Reuben and the people of Gad called the altar witness, for they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God." Okay, so the, committee, the commission is relieved. They go back to deliver the good news. And the altar is named witness. And it's interesting because what, what was this witness supposed to be? It's supposed to be between the east and the west of, of Israel. And uh, by the time we get to the end, they're all willing to call it a witness that the Lord is God. So they're like, let's turn this into a positive for all of us instead of a division. Uh, maybe an opportunity for unity. Okay. So uh, takeaways, we've got a couple minutes here. What are some things we can take from this close encounter with civil war? So even though the kingdom of Israel is going to be divided north and south, the initial tension between the, t the tribes is instead the east to west boundary of the Jordan. And that makes sense. It's a natural, you know, geographic boundary. Uh, so I, I tend to see, I, 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 I say that I tend to see people in a mirror, uh, and, and usually, when you look at two different sides of the dispute, they're kind of saying the, the same thing or worried about a lot of the same things. And I think this is a case where they're worried about, um, they're worried about uh, I'm sorry, they're assuming the worst in each other. Each side is assuming the worst in the other side. The Transjordan tribes, they fear the worst in the other tribes west of the Jordan, fearing that one day they would be cut off from worshiping at the tabernacle. And so I have to ask myself, where does this fear come from? Is this, a, is this a rational fear? There's no evidence in the scripture of any talk or conspiracy for this concern. Obviously, I wasn't there. But there's nothing recorded for us. So it doesn't seem like it's a grounded fear, but it's, it's there nonetheless. And on the flip side, the rest of the people of Israel assume the worst in the Transjordan tribes, that they set up an altar as a rebellion and a breach of faith against God, either to worship another god or worship God inappropriately. So where did this fear come from? Uh, well, they heard the altar was being built. Uh, so it's not, in this case, uh, un unfounded or grounded in zero evidence. But it's still grounded in fear and without knowledge as to why this altar was built. In some ways, I think the other people, yeah, they, they make their case pretty well, too, of why they're concerned um, about you know, inappropriate worship. I can't help but, again, think about our, our charged political moment. I see, you know, people from both ends of the spectrum in a mirror as well. Uh, you know, conservatives, we talk about, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> conservatives talk about the radical left. Uh, liberals speak of far-right extremists. Uh, both sides say they fear threats to our democracy from the other side. Uh, we paint in these broad strokes, and we assume the worst from the other side of the river, uh, or the political aisle in this case. But that brings us to the other uh, takeaway from this counter, uh, encounter, the, the wisdom to investigate and discuss. The 10 tribes, they were ready to go to war, but they didn't march out with their soldiers. They took a small group of respected leaders to investigate the matter, and they heard out the other side. I'm reminded of Proverbs 1817. Uh, and I hope there's someone here. Yeah, no, it's Joshua at the end. Okay, Proverbs 1817, the one who s states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So yeah, you're, you, you might have your, your fears and concerns, but have you really examined uh, what's actually going on? Uh, we're also reminded of, of Jesus' teachings in, in Matthew 18, where if you've got a problem, if a brother sins against you, you know, start small, confront him about it, and then take it to, uh, to the leaders of the church. Uh, so bring in others as, as needed. Uh, back to our uh, political moment for a second. Well, we're really struggling right now to hear each other. I, th I think we all understand this. And yeah, there's absolutely some differences 
on both sides of the aisle, but there's also a, a lack of willingness to, to talk, or we at least see that. Now, when I do have those disagreements in, in real life, I find that we can have those discussions, but you don't see that much on uh, a lot of the news. Uh, instead, we see political, and debate, uh, political debate and discussions turning into shouting matches. That's not going to get anywhere. Uh, as Christians, let's look to the example set in Joshua 22. Let's commit ourselves to not assuming the worst in other people, and instead, let's have a discussion with them. So, sorry, I kind of talked all through that. Um, how about consider Joshua 22, and after we review it uh, next week, if you have any other thoughts on that, or if you want to share any thoughts with me after class, I'd, I'd love to hear them. And so next time on the conquest, uh, Joshua knows that his time is passing. And so he calls together the leaders of the people of Israel, and he instructs them to stay faithful to God. Uh, then he will challenge all the people of Israel to continue uh, to choose the Lord as God. And I hope you're going to be here next week as we look at uh, Joshua's encouragement to his people to be faithful. Thank you.